Katara and Zuko. So we've seen these two throw down a few times in the series, but in a one-on-one -on -one match with no holding back, no interruptions, no Sozin's Comet, no full moon, who would win? Hey everyone, welcome to the Versus series where I pit fictional characters together and determine who is more combatively viable and more likely to beat the other. Today we have Katara versus Zuko. I chose this pair because one, it's been requested a lot, and two, I think actually it's a pretty fair matchup. We've seen them both grow over the course of the series, a Katara barely being able to, you know, pick up a water bubble, and then Zuko being not so great with firebending in relation to some of the great firebenders, but both of them at the end of their series, both of them became great masters. First off, let's establish some ground rules. Uh, we are going to be observing these characters as they appear in the current comics. So that's up to North and South comics for both Zuko and Katara. Also within the context of this matchup, we are thinking about these characters with morals on. They're gonna be in character. However, they are not going to hold back, but things like bloodbending, which obviously wouldn't happen anyway, because there's no full moon here that wouldn't happen because Katara her character her moral stance is that she will not use that for my versus series I like to do a breakdown of three rounds uh, for Avatar I do physical abilities bending abilities and then tactical abilities so that's how we're going to be going about this step by step and then at the end of all of that we're going to be talking about a verdict in which I determine who is the most likely victor if you already are familiar with Zuko and Katara's feats in terms of what they can do with their bending abilities, you can really just skip through all of this and just go straight to my verdict. Uh, that's where the meat of the conversation and the, the comparison is going to be. And I also don't want you to be bored if you already know everything about these characters. So you can skip through that if you want to. Also something I would like to add to my versus series, author bias. I actually want you to talk about what kinds of biases I have uh, around these characters. For Katara, Love her as a character. I think she's kind of undervalued a little bit within the Avatar fandom. However, as a combative person, I don't um, appreciate her ascension to her masterhood and her power. I feel like she built herself up a little bit too quickly. Uh, I feel like the entire series had too many prodigies in it. So I kind of hold that against her sometimes in my um, view of her or my examination her, of her as a character as, in terms of a fighter. So I'm going to try my best to, to keep that, to, to rein that in a little bit, but just know that that is a bias that the author, the person who's talking to you right now, might have in this breakdown. And in terms of my bias for Zuko, uh, he is hands down my favorite character of the entire series of both Last Airbender and Legend of Korra, Rise of Kiyoshi, anything that has been put out up until this date, he is my favorite character. So I definitely have to be careful about, you know, siding with him too much just on the favor of me liking him as a character. So keep that in mind too, as you're observing my review, I might have these biases come up, but I just wanted to present them here so that it's all laid out on the table and you can know who I am as an Avatar fan and kind of understand how I'm, you know, diving into this comparison. All right, let's get into it. So let's talk about their physical abilities. First, let's talk about Katara's best showings of physical prowess. Uh, one, for dexterity, we have her flipping off of Paku's ramp and landing on a somewhat small ice banister with no imbalance. But really, other than that, we don't have a lot more to go off of her. We don't have a lot of examples about her being dexterous. Uh, as I'll talk about more uh, in this breakdown, Katara seems to be more of a water bending dependent uh, mobility fighter. She doesn't really have much in terms of her own physicality. Now, in terms of fortitude, she does have a bit more examples. Uh, for one, she was tossed into the catacomb crystals and recovers very quickly. Uh, granted, uh, in terms of Avatar characters in general, they seem to be slightly above human strength, a uh, regular human being strength, as they oftentimes are, you know, thrown and hurled around uh, and they recover relatively quickly when a regular human would be dead or, or crippled. But uh, while sparring with Toph, she also takes a rock to the chest and gets right back up. But probably her best showing is being hit by a huge pillar and recovering shortly after in the North and South comics. In terms of her stamina, her best showing definitely would be that episode in the desert in book two where she was trekking through the desert for a full day while keeping her wits about her 
uh, much better than her companions who were kind of falling to the wayside. But in general, I don't think Katara has any significant showings in terms of physicality, whether by strength, dexterity, or stamina. Only thing I can think of in terms of a general sense uh, in her physical abilities was her hand-to-hand -hand exchange with Paku, uh, which was very short, and of course Paku won that bout. But generally speaking, as I said before, we just don't have a lot from Katara in terms of her offensive physical showings, her best showings. Even when it comes to her worst showcases of physical prowess, the only time we ever see her not winning by way of physicality is her losing to Ty Lee twice, though this defeat could not be factored in greatly against Zuko because he doesn't quite match the dexterity of a Ty Lee. Uh, still, this is the only examples we have of Katara and her, her cap in terms of her physical abilities, but again, it's Ty Lee, so she's going to be beating most everybody in the universe in terms of just straight physicality, no bending applied, all that kind of stuff. I mean, granted, Ty Lee was fighting against people who were bending, so that is a, you know, extra up uh, on Ty Lee. So this isn't really too much a bad showing for uh, Katara necessarily, and more is just a good showing for Ty Lee and something that can't really apply to Zuko because Zuko isn't on that same tier of physical fighter as Ty Lee. Moving on to Zuko, his best showcase of physical prowess. So first we have dexterity. He evades a series of strikes from a craze Azula without fire bending. Uh, in terms of stamina, he has the ability to swim through hidden coves of the Northern Water Tribe for what seemed to be several minutes. And he was also able to carry Aang through the snow and through a snowstorm going against Wynn at a fairly great distance. He's also a master of breath control, which was something that he had an issue with at the beginning of the series. Of course, this was taught to him by Uncle Iroh, who made it a point in that it's very important that breathing is extremely, extremely vital to good firebending. And this is only elevated when we see him uh, training with the dragons. This specific kind of feat uh, factors in heavily with his fights against other firebenders like in an Agni Kai, whether he was going against Zhao, or uh, of course, the, the big, big fight he had with Azula during Sozin's Comet. In particular, with his fight with Azula, we see that she is very taxed, very exhausted. Of course, she was off her game and she was a little bit uh, you know, mentally unstable, but still we see that over the course of the series, Zuko has really controlled his master of breathing, which is a good, good stamp for his stamina, meaning he can go on for long, long bouts. In terms of his general physical abilities and his best showings, uh, we have him escaping from the Po Huai stronghold with Aang when he was the Blue Spirit. He was also fighting evenly with Aang in terms of hand-to-hand -hand combat, though of course Aang has a slight advantage with his evasion. He also was able to defeat Earth Kingdom soldiers hand-to-hand. -hand. Uh, he only pulled out his swords out for the Earthbending captain later in that fight. Uh, and then he fights evenly with Jet in a sword-to-sword -sword fight before uh, that bout was interrupted by the police. But in terms of his worst showcase of physical prowess, we have in terms of his dexterity, he loses against Azula in hand-to-hand -hand combat in the first episode we see of Azula. And again, years later in Smoke and Shadow in the comics, uh, Azula is still over him in terms of physical hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, in terms of strength, uh, we see that his cap is losing against the Earth Kingdom captain during the episode Zuko Alone, where he had to use fire bending to tip the edge in his favor. So now the verdict. So in terms of my comparative conclusions, uh, first I want to look at strength and fortitude, dexterity, stamina, and then overall physical advantage. In terms of strength and fortitude, I think the advantage would go to Zuko. Katara simply does not have the strength showings to overcome Zuko. In fact, in the comic, The Promise, we saw how Zuko had her in that, that stronghold and she could not get out of it without Aang kind of, you know, threatening Zuko to, hey, put her down. But if, we, if it ever came to a blow of strength hand-to-hand, -hand, uh, Zuko definitely has the advantage for sure. In terms of dexterity, the advantage again goes to Zuko. He has a much better foundation in terms of his martial training with his swords and also in terms of just his fighting style. We've seen that he is a little bit more dexterous. Of course, he's no Tai Lee, which is the only comparison we have between him and Katara. Tai Lee is a monster of a physical uh, opponent uh, in terms of just hand-to-hand -hand, non-bending. And uh, while it's true that Katara can contend with Zuko's physicality, through her bending in this specific round, we're only looking at physical abilities and she simply does not have the same showings as Zuko in terms of being able to, without bending, actually contend with him. In terms of stamina, again, I believe the advantage goes to Zuko. Uh, we have a direct comparison between the two characters, one being Zuko carrying Aang on his back in the North Pole when he was taking him away from the Northern uh, Tribe uh, Fortress and he was going against a snowstorm, doing it for several miles. We don't know the exact distance between where he was and, and the cove that he stopped at, but that was a fair distance. 
very, it shows a lot of stamina. That on top of the fact that he does have training in, in breathing and being able to sustain himself in long form fights, whether it's an Agni Kai or with another bender. For Katara, we also have her having a pretty good showing of stamina when she was going through the desert and keeping the whole group together, but I don't think it exactly compares to Zuko. Uh, while I don't think this is a great advantage for Zuko like the other two uh, categories we just talked about, I do think it is still very definitive that Zuko has the stamina advantage uh, against Katara, and if it ever came to blows of strength or just a war of attrition, it would be Zuko who would eventually take that matchup. So as an overall physical advantage, I think it definitely goes to Zuko. However, as we all know with these matchups, it's not just about one category or several categories, it's about the cumulative advantages. Which brings us into our next round, bending abilities. All right, so let's talk about the bending abilities uh, for Katara. Her best showings. First, let's talk about her offensive abilities. Uh, in terms of scale, uh, we've seen her create massive waves that separate two Fire Nation ships uh, at the beginning of Book 3. She bends a near tidal wave through a Fire Nation factory. Though it should be noted, there was a full moon during this time and during this scene, so that could factor into her ability to make this tidal wave. Both of these feats sort of culminate in a more active combat when she defends against uh, Combustion Man and after the assassin comes for Team Avatar, showing that if she had the available water source, she could manifest grand waves of water mid-combat. This is further solidified later when she meets Combustion Man for the last time where she controls a wave turns them into dozens of ice daggers and flings them at Combustion Man. Now in terms of precision, we've seen uh, her trapping Azula's arm with the tentacle arm technique, uh, use her own sweat to break out of a wooden gel, create ice daggers with hard falling rain, like middle of a rainstorm, just stopping everything, like that's crazy precision. Uh, she also uses water to slice through a boulder in the Promise comics. Uh, she plant bins. She binds a soldier's wrist with only a tiny jar of water in the North and South comics. When her legs are disabled via chi blocking in that same comic series, she's still able to bend and ice her opponent. Now moving on to her defensive abilities, uh, first in terms of scale, shout outs to my beta reader Josiah Jenks on this spot for a feat. Uh, I didn't even think about it until he mentioned it. But one of Katara's most impressive feats in terms of defense via scale comes by way of her stonewall defense against Hama's water attack. Her defense is more akin to an earthbender, a possible influence from Toph, than a waterbender who typically tries to redirect. This is very compelling to me because uh, as we've seen with other masters like Iroh, integration of other styles into one's native bending form is usually a mark of mastery. Uh, it's always great when you can adapt from something else, whether that is Iroh learning redirection of lightning through waterbending, or what it seems to be uh, Katara kind of implementing a more earthbender idea of uh, defense by straight up stonewalling the attack from Hama. But beyond that, we've also seen her blocking the charged lightning of Azula uh, at the end of book three. She also blocks a straight up punch from Old Iron, an ancient spirit who contends with avatars with ice. So the fact that she could do that uh, is pretty significant. Now in terms of precision and defense, she can heal with water, though this has never really been shown to be effective uh, in the middle of a battle, and she likely needs to do this uh, when she has time to be able to do it, not in the middle of a fight. However, she does have a very good showing of precision when she trapped uh, a Sozin's Comet boosted Azula in ice just before Azula zaps her with uh, lightning. And in overall sense, in general, we see that Katara defeats Hama through bloodbending on her first try. Bloodbending is an auto win under full moon, though Katara in character and morals on would not use these in most cases, so it doesn't really factor into this matchup. Uh, she also was winning her fight against Azula before being interrupted by Zuko in the finale of book two, uh, and she also defeated the Sozin's Comet uh, Azula. Yes, you could say that she had the environmental advantage, but a win is a win. Now her worst showings in terms of her bending uh, in general is that she lost the General Fong, uh, she was trapped in the ground, she lost to Paku, she was trapped in ice, but of course that was her in book one and not book three in the comics as we see her now, so keep that in mind. She also lost to Toph, and as she was trapped in quicksand, this showed up in the Lost Adventure comics. Now moving on to Zuko, his best showings of offense. Uh, first, let's look at scale. Uh, his biggest uh, scale 
feet would be him blasting through Aang's Crystal Defense and Earth Kingdom Catacombs. In terms of precision, he lights a whole courtyard of candles in seconds when he was on the, the date with that Earth Kingdom girl. In terms of defense, uh, in terms of defensive scale, he blocked against a lethal explosion, an assassination attempt uh, committed by uh, Commander Admiral Zhao. I think it was Admiral Zhao at that time. He also blocked against Combustion Man's attack. He uses dragon fire technique against the new Ozai society, which of course he learned from the dragons themselves, which is a big factor in terms of Zuko's, you know, ability in terms of just bending in general is that he, you know, has training from the original firebenders. In terms of precision, uh, he's able to block and cuts through an arrow shot at him uh, at one point in the book two. Uh, lightning redirection against Ozai, which is huge because Ozai's lightning, as we can see from the, the, at least the visual language, shows us that he has probably the most powerful lightning in the show. Uh, he also has partial lightning redirection against Azula during Sozin's Comet. Uh, of course, that was uh, interrupted and messed up because he was trying to save Katara, but he still was able to survive it. And then, of course, later he had a full lightning redirection against Azula and the Search Comics. In general, it seems like he favors a close-range firebending sweeping kick spin attack thing several times in his fights, like against Zhao and against the Kyoshi Warriors, and against Azula during the Sozin's Comet a uh, big Agni Kai fight, which is what initially trips her up. In general, he has matched Azula twice, first at the Western Air Temple and then at the Fire Nation Palace. Uh, he continues to match her in the following comics because she was still deranged, but he is eventually overcome by her in the latest comics featuring her where she gets her mind right in Smoke and Shadow. We've also seen that he's been able to use fire jets for a brief bit of flying when he was pulling up the Earth King along a broken bridge, yet we haven't actually seen him do this during the middle of combat, so I don't know how viable that is to an actual fight. Now, in terms of his worst showings, he seems to lack the ability to produce lightning. Yes, he is able to redirect it, but at least now, in terms of the most current comics, he is not able to actually produce it. Uh, defensively, one of his worst showings was when uh, Azula recentered herself uh, in the Smoke and Shadow comics uh, and learned how to do lightning redirection. Zuko was not able to block it, though in fairness, Zuko was not expecting Azula to rebound his lightning to begin with, so we could, you know, give him a little bit of credit there because he didn't think that she would be able to do it. And in general, he has lost his fair few of uh, uh, fights uh, against Aang and Katara, but this, of course, was in book one, and he's progressed since then, um, and he had a quick defeat against the Dai Li agents in the finale of book two, but again, he has progressed from this, and we haven't seen many, at least, cataclysmic uh, defeats, except for with Azula uh, since then. Okay, so who holds the bending advantage? Uh, as we've seen, these two have fought several times before in the show. Uh, once at the spring in the northern uh, water tribe where we saw Aang going into the spirit world. Uh, we saw that what, what was happening there is that it was the advantage of the environment. So whether it was the full moon back in Katara or Zuko having the sun at his back, the advantage was very circumstantial. Later, we see them fight again in the north, north, uh, past the fortress, uh, in which case, of course, uh, Katara had the advantage where there was no sun at all, a bunch of snow everywhere, and she completely stomped Zuko. Uh, the best fight that we have in terms of them being just on even footing would be at the end of the book two finale, where they were in the catacombs, in which case they were fighting pretty much on par. That said, in terms of grand scale, Katara has the advantage. We've seen her push apart two warships. We've seen her manifest what should have been a tidal wave when she was helping that town as the Painted Lady. And while it's true that Zuko does have dragon fire and we've seen how he's used that as a defense in the comics, I don't think it necessarily compares to Katara's showings. Also, we've never really seen Zuko use his ability offensively, just defensively, um, and it just kind of swirled around him. So I can't really say for sure that he can get the scale advantage. Katara just has better showings in that regard. In terms of precision, uh, I, again, I think that Katara has the advantage here. Based on the nature of water bending itself, it's just gonna be more precise. Uh, when you can make water into sleets of little ice daggers, uh, that's definitely gonna be better than fire, whether even if it's a powerful fire, you can if you can just get those little daggers in there, you can make it happen. Huge example of this, though this was earthbending, not waterbending, uh, is the fight between Jian Zhu and Kelsang in The Rise of the Kyoshi. In fact, on top of that, and in terms of Katara's precision as an offensive fighter, we've seen that she has almost 
every single sub-discipline of water bending down, whether it's plant bending, blood bending, ice bending. Really the only thing that we haven't seen from her and something that probably she doesn't have would be spirit bending, which is irrelevant anyway because this is a fight between two human characters, not any spirit characters. Now in terms of defenses uh, with regards to scale, I think there is a marginal advantage to Katara. While they've both defended against large attacks, uh, Zuko surviving in a, a direct explosion from uh, Commander Zhao, and Katara defending against ancient spirits, Katara might have a slight advantage based on her element, which is more suited for stonewall defenses like an ice wall, or simply having the ability to completely push your opponent away with a huge and giant water wave. But in terms of precision, in, in terms of defense and precision, I don't think there really is any huge advantage to either of these combatants. Neither has anything significant that can go over the other in terms of defensive precision. And they don't really do much of that in, in this in the series. So the overall advantage of, in terms of the bending abilities would go to Katara, uh, mostly on the back of her offensive scale and precision, though I do think that their defenses are relatively on par with Katara taking a slight advantage. All right, let's talk about their tactical abilities. First, let's do the best showings from Katara. We're gonna do a breakdown of strategy and impromptu thinking, uh, basically strategy versus tactics. For Katara's strategy, it seems like her go-to seems to be her water whip technique, relying on those forms to bring down her opponent, which was effective against fighting against Azula and Zuko at the end of book two, and later effective against water bending fodder in the North and South comics. Uh, in terms of her moment-to-moment -moment decision making, Katara is quite resourceful in the moment, like when she advised her group to get water from the sparse clouds above when they were in the desert, or when she used her own sweat to break out of prison. Now, of course, this is all coming off the basis, or not all of it, but a lot of this comes from the basis of her training with Hama, who taught her that water is in pretty much everything. Water can be in the air, you can get water from yourself, you can get water from plants. So she does have a huge resource in terms of being able to make those decisions a moment to moment. Also, in terms of her mental ability when it comes to moment to moment decision making, we've seen that she is able to keep her cool where she was able to have the upper hand on Azula and, you know, actually be able to have situational awareness enough to move the fight to a location that was best for her. Now, some of the worst showings for Katara, which isn't really a worst showing, but more in an observation of me when I actually see her fight, is that she can sometimes be a little flat footed and rooted when in a straight up fight. True, she does use ice pass and water waves to transport occasionally, but it doesn't seem to be her go-to tactic so much as an afterthought. And it seems she prefers to settle into her water whips and fight head on instead of outmaneuvering her opponent by subverting their flanks or what have you. And overall, it was actually pretty difficult trying to gather up kind of tactical abilities and strategies for Katara as she was not the main crux in the group for that kind of thing. They usually went to Sokka for that sort of a thing. So she doesn't have a lot of showings to actually analyze in terms of her tactical abilities, but we do have these few here that we can kind of go off of. For Zuko, uh, we have a few of his showings as well in terms of strategies and impromptu thinking. In terms of strategy, he was able to track his uncle uh, after Iroh was captured by the Earthbenders. He was also able to use his damaged ship's smoke to create a smoke screen to cloak his, uh, his approach when he was near Commander Zhao. He was also successful at reorganizing the Fire Nation army to be a more compact and uh, efficient fighting group when he became Fire Lord. Of course, this was seen in the North and South comic books. Uh, and generally, Zuko seems to adapt to his opponent, switching up his style depending on who he is facing. In his earlier fights, particularly in Book 1, he was very charging head first mentality whereas in book two he tapered a bit and became a, a more fluid person between offense and defense and then later in his book three fights and beyond he became more cautious but still packed a punch when needed this is best shown during his book three agni kai fight with azula where he was very balanced in terms of his style and showing how he culminated into being not this brash i'm just gonna go in head first and fight you to being kind of more like, okay, let me balance between uh, offense and defense. And now he kind of has more of a defense first mentality, figure out my opponent and then fight them uh, with my offense, which I already know I have a, a pretty good and solid backing of. We saw him uh, successfully infiltrate the Pohuai Fortress as the Blue Spirit. We also saw how he was intuitive enough to follow the penguins in the Northern Water Tribe Fortress to know that there was an opening that he could swim to. Uh, so that's, you know, relatively good thinking in terms of moment to moment thinking. And he was able to use his Dao swords to reflect light and trick the Sun Warrior door to let him and Aang in when they wanted to learn from the original masters. 
Now his worst showings of strategy, uh, he's not always the sharpest, uh, but that can sometimes be brought up by his pride more than a lack of intellect. Like how he wanted to face Azula even though Iroh advised against that and he advised running away at the end of book two. Uh, in terms of moment-to-moment -moment fighting, uh, Zuko sometimes puts himself into a corner. For example, though his Pohai Fortress showing was great, he found himself in a corner and couldn't actually make it out of it if it wasn't for Aang. And later, he didn't know where to go when he took Aang to the north. Sure, he had a good idea of getting into the fortress and taking Aang and getting him away, but he didn't think it through to, okay, well, where am I going to take him after this? And then, of course, he got himself stuck in the north. And when he faced off against Azula and Aang in the episode The Chase, he fell right into that missing floor on the second floor while the other two kept their balance and maintained their posture under new and unexpected circumstances. Or in Lake Laogai, where he didn't really quite know what to do with Appa when he took him. He's really good at picking up things to get into a situation, but in terms of getting out of it, uh, sometimes he doesn't give as much forethought as he should. In general, of course, he was constantly outsmarted by Azula, but... I mean, it's Azula. <laughs> if anything, this can come off as a good showing because he has to deal with Azula his whole life and thus had to be smart enough to keep up with her schemes and her machinations. Even if he doesn't end up matching her, just the fact that he was growing up with someone like that goes a long way. So let's compare the two. In terms of strategy, the overall strategy between Katara and Zuko, I do think that Zuko takes the advantage. Though he's not super great in his in the moment decision making, uh, when he does have forethought and the time to take everything in, I think he actually is very intelligent, whether we've seen him uh, tracking Iroh, whether he was making up that shield with Commander Zhao or Admiral Zhao or Captain Zhao, I forget what he was during that point in the show. Uh, he actually is very smart in, you know, figuring out a plan and, and doing and enacting that plan. Also, his general fighting style is a bit more dynamic than Katara. Katara can get a little bit flat-footed in her stance. Not to say that it has not worked for her, but if ever found in a situation where she needed to start employing something that's a little bit more dynamic than just flat-footed, you know, waterbending, uh, I think Zuka would hold the advantage there as well. In terms of tactics and impromptu, you know, thinking on the go, I don't think either of these uh, opponents have an advantage over the other. Perhaps you can make an argument that book one and book two Zuko would more likely uh, have a disadvantage against Katara because he was a little bit um, headstrong and he, in the moment, could make bad decisions decisions but of course we're looking at Zuko as he is in book three and beyond in the comics where he has kind of you know curtailed his uh his passion and his hatred a little bit and has a little bit more insight uh in his moment to moment decision making so the overall advantage I think will go to Zuko though it's very slight and it's more on the basis of his strategy than his moment to moment tactics in which case I think him and Katara are pretty much on par but overall Zuko advantage for tactical abilities All right, so let's talk about the ultimate verdict, who would win? First, we had our physical ability matchup, in which case I gave the advantage to Zuko. A pretty definitive advantage because of his natural abilities with his martial prowess. Then in the bending section, I gave the advantage to Katara, mostly by way of her offensive skill of precision and skill, though I do think their defenses are relatively on par. Then with tactical abilities, we gave it to Zuko at a slight advantage, mostly based on his strategy and not so much on his moment to moment decision making, in which case both of them are, you know, relatively on par. So let's set up this fight. Let's say it takes place in the Maizu village, which happened in the short story um, Origami from the Avatar Tales. I chose this location because it's a place where Katara has a good amount of water, but not too much water. It's not an ocean, it's not a huge river, but a stream. And also we're gonna set this at the time of dusk or dawn so that Zuko doesn't have an advantage or Katara doesn't have an advantage with the moon or the sun. As I've said before, we've seen them in fights where they had advantages based on their environment and based on, you know, time of day. So we're going to take that away and that's not going to be the case in this specific hypothetical matchup. The following is a hypothetical explanation of the possible outcomes. Okay, so first let's have a discussion about the early fight. Unlike Zuko, Katara actually has a few one-shot abilities, mostly by way of frosting Zuko in place as she's done to other foes, including other waterbenders, though it should be noted that said waterbenders were fodder. But in any case, like in her examples of facing off against firebenders, particularly in the promised graphic novel, if she catches Zuko unawares, this can be a possibility of an early fight victory. By contrast, outside of a straight up surprise fire blast, Zuko doesn't have much in his arsenal to snag an early victory. 
Therefore, I think the advantage goes to Katara in the early fight with a 2-0 advantage. And then with the mid fight, I think that it would be fairly close. Though I still think that Katara would still hold the advantage based mostly on her offensive superiority in scale and precision. Katara can do quite a lot with even small amounts of water, but considering the stage and the fact that she only has a stream at her disposal uh, as opposed to a ocean, she still could dole out quite a bit of hurt. Even if Zuko pulls out something like a dragon fire technique, she could easily get away with the wave which we've seen she's done to increase her mobility. And in doing this, she just wait out Zuko until his fire extinguished and then set herself up into a new attack sequence where she maintained her bending advantage over Zuko. That said, I do think that Zuko would do a better job of chipping away at her defenses, whether by way of his fire whips or quick successive use of fire jabs or what have you. And I believe his strategy would be to get in as close as possible to Katara in a similar fashion as he did against Azula during their Western Air Temple fight, where he would use his sweeping kick maneuver that he favors. Here, I feel Zuko would be more effective, where he can mitigate a lot of Katara's range attacks. The issue here is him actually doing this, as we've seen that her octopus form is quite strong and he'd still have to watch out for being potentially frosted to the ground like in the early fight. But if he does bridge that gap, he could manage to bring her down either through firebending or via pure physicality. That all said, I still think Katara has a 4-3 advantage in the mid fight. And then of course we have the late fight, the war of attrition. If Zuko can weather the tsunami that is Katara, then I see that the most likely scenario in the late fight being at his advantage. As stated before, though Katara isn't entirely out of her element here, Zuko has better stamina than she does and would most likely pull away bridging the gap between her bending advantage. His victories in these late scenarios are solid, so his main hurdle is getting there in the first place. So, in the end, I would say advantage to Zuko, 1-0 in the late fight. So, in terms of all of these scenarios, I think this most likely ends in the mid-fight. I don't see this really ending in the early fight as, you know, the only time we've ever seen Katara stomp Zuka was when he was at a disadvantage of having no sun and she had snow all around her. We've seen them fight several other times and they were fighting on par with each other. There's nothing really in their arsenals that would say that this would end within one to 10 seconds. It would go on for at least a few minutes. And we also have to keep in mind the location that we set up for these characters, in which case, neither of them hold any significant advantage. And while I don't see something like Katara frosting uh, Zuko to the ground, I also don't see this getting all the way to the late fight where I think Zuko holds the advantage because of his stamina. Instead, I think this one rests right in the middle. I don't think it's gonna be a rapid fight. I don't think it's gonna be a super drawn out long fight. I think it's gonna be one of those standard fights that we've seen from Avatar, very middle ground, and I think that the advantage ultimately will go to Katara. Zuko would certainly put up a fight, and I definitely don't see Katara getting out of this without some burns and bruises, but I don't see Zuko actually winning. Her waterbending scale is too much. Uh, her mobility is completely elevated once she has waterbending uh, at her advantage, which negates Zuko's physical advantage. So it doesn't really matter that he has a physical advantage when Katara can actually contend with that with her waterbending, whether she's pulling up a wave or a stream that she can ride or use to flip overhead or any of those reasons, any number of reasons. But again, Zuko is not a Tai Li, so he can't elevate over that bending ability in the same way that Tai Li can because Zuko isn't as physically mobile <laughs> as a Tai Li. And then also there's a case of Katara's precision in her offensive abilities with bending, in which case I think Zuko would have a hard time contending with. Uh, sure, he probably could melt a lot of her ice daggers, but if the fight does go on a little bit and he isn't able to maintain that focus, I think that some of those can get through. Though I think most likely this would end on the basis of a scale attack, not a precision attack. The, the grand waves or some sort of big uh, attack against Zuko, not necessarily like a, an ice dagger or, or, or water whip. Though those could happen as well, but I think it's more likely that it's gonna be a large attack that would take down Zuko. And ultimately, I think that the overall advantage that Katara would have would be a very slim six out of 10 matches. Of course, this is all my opinion based on the lore of Avatar The Last Airbender. Do you agree that Katara would take the ultimate victory, the majority victory, the more likely victory, or do you think that Zuko has a better chance? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, peace, love, and remember, be water, my friends.